so we're all on the same page. And thanks, thanks really for your interest in this school. So, uh, you know, we, we have had a couple of uh, trainings uh, already. We had one at uh, the APEC Climate Center. Uh, I think Hussein was there about, about a year ago. Uh, and we, we, had, we had a little mini training a couple of weeks back at, at the, the, uh, the ASEAN Climate Outlook Forum pre-COF that the RISAN uh, organized. But this is the first time that... Uh, there's a training course on actually how to use the database. So this is, this is really, really a first. And we really appreciate you being the, the guinea pigs and, and, and uh, you know, being, being uh, engaged and enthusiastic to, to get, get your hands on, on, the, on the data and uh, see what we can do with it. So... This, this is week two, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing about what happened in week one and, and uh, what, every, what everyone's doing, uh, how, how the practical exercises how the practical exercises have gone. So in the week two, as, as Adrian said, there's quite a bit more focus on more the application side. Uh, but also we, ha we have some dynamical modeling. We have Steve here. We didn't want to make it all just... Uh, you know, uh, dynamics in the first week and, and applications in the second. We wanted to we wanted to mix it up. So we've we've got Steve Woolno here, who who's going to be talking about uh, modeling the MJO and also the uh, the stratosphere as being another of the uh, the sources of predictability on on the S two S scale. But uh, today we'll have uh, it'll be mostly sort of applications oriented, and I'll I'll give the introductory talk on some um, on applications, and then we'll we'll have Frederick. Uh, the other Frederick from ECMWF here, who's going who's gonna to talk about uh, applications in more detail in, in drought forecasting today, and then tomorrow we'll be on on the other on on the flood on flood forecasting, and actually have a there's a there's a flood forecasting game uh, that we're all looking forward to on on, uh, on on Tuesday afternoon, and then we we have uh, we have Vincent Morin. Uh, this morning and, and tomorrow, who's going to be talking more about uh, the downscaling and weather climate relationships, uh, especially weather types today, uh, and then uh, uh, towards thinking about a prediction of local scale rainfall uh, uh, tomorrow. And then through, through the week, uh, on, on when, so we'll be having the, the practical exercises in the afternoons. And so I think the thinking is that uh, this week, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be more on, on your case studies, and, and we can discuss what more, uh, that, that much more. And uh, as Paola said, we, we may have a, a, also uh, this afternoon a, a demo on how to install all the software on, on your own laptops. And I thought, well, maybe this afternoon might be a good time to have that uh, after the, the verification. There's a, there's a talk, there's, there'll be a talk on verification. It won't be 90 minutes, but probably more like 45, and that might be a good time. Then, uh, Rizan, on Wednesday morning, Rizan is going to, to describe this, this initiative with, with ASEAN COF. I think it's, 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 a, nice, it's, a, it's a really nice example. So I, I'm, I'm pleased that Rizan volunteered to give, give, a, give a talk on that on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we have some room for... Uh, uh, participants' presentations, and I don't know if, if uh, you've talked about this at all last week, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll play that by ear. I know there's a couple of people who'd like to present something, uh, but there's, there's room for there's, there's there's plenty of room in the schedule as as we go uh, later into the week. So that's sort of what the schedule looks like. Any any questions about any questions about the program for this week? So if not, we can we, we can get right into it. Uh, so I, I called this I, I I revised the title of this to be applications consideration. So uh, this is a huge topic, and what I wanted to basically do here is just uh, introduce some of the some of the considerations uh, on the application side, uh, the types of. Uh, forecast user and application, and then what makes uh, forecast information valuable to a user? What do we need to be thinking about? Things like the salience of information, its timeliness, uh, how credible the information is, is it understandable, and uh, is it, does it come from a legitimate source? 
And the basic question is here is, can we translate scientific information into, into useful knowledge? It, it might seem obvious, but uh, I, was just, I was just sort of uh, skimming through this, this book. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's a book by a guy called Nate Silver, and it has a, it has a great title, The Signal and the Noise, Why So Many Predictions Fail, But Some Don't. So... <laughs> I, one of the things he's saying there is things like uh, trying to predict the stock market has been a miserable failure or trying to predict, predict uh, uh, recessions and things like that. But some things are actually more successful. And one of the, one of the, the things that uh, he says doesn't fail is the, the, his example is, is weather forecasting. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing, uh, uh, thinking about that. You can think about that in the, in the case of, I hope that S2S is also going to fall into this this category of, of ones that don't. Adrian? Why do people think the stock Yes, right. <laughs> so in the context of, of you know, why, why this is challenging to uh, you know, uh, produce information and have it used, this is a, uh, one illustration that he gives. And what's shown here is the, G the global GDP per capita uh, in the world. And it's showing the evolution of this. And he pointed out the... Uh, the invention of, of the printing press in uh, 1440 as being a seminal event where uh, suddenly you know, information could be shared because before that you know, everything had to be copied by hand. But that the GDP stayed more or less flat for another two or three hundred years and the steam engine was invented in 1775 and then it took off. So there's this huge lag between... You know, uh, information being starting to be shared and produced and, and it being used in, in the history, history of GDP. So uh, I just put that up for fun and saying, well, I hope it doesn't take that long, you know, for, for S2S uh, forecasting capabilities to, to, uh, to, to, have, to have some real value. But just to underline that it's not, it's not a trivial thing to, uh, if you have information, that it really be translated in, into something of value. And this is something we've been struggling with uh, at, uh, at, Est at, sorry, at, at, uh, at the IRI uh, for almost 20 years now. And uh, so often you'll see, well, applications, that's just you know, a little box at the end. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll make the forecast and, and everything. Uh, we'll do all the science, and then at the end, there'll be the applications. And the S2S project is, is maybe a little bit like that, in that uh, all, the, all the people, most of the people involved in, in that are on the, the modeling uh, and, and the science side, but there actually isn't that much uh, on, on the application side yet. So that's where we're hoping that you guys can help. And I, I don't actually have that schematic, but maybe it was shown last week the, the S2S graphic, I'm sure that uh, Frederick showed that, where you have all the sub-projects, and then you have those pillars, and then you have the database underneath. And then two of the, the two main two pillars, we all the, all, we have all the, the science issues uh, about, about predictability, and then, and then all the modeling, modeling issues, things like initialization, ensembles, etc. And then the last one says needs and applications. And then basically it says at the bottom, uh, well, we will liaise with the, the World Weather Research Programs, uh, uh, science, societal, uh, e economic research, uh, SERA, and applications uh, project, and we'll, we'll somehow get this done. So, uh, so far, there's, there's, there's not been much on the application side, but it's something that we really want to, we, we want to uh, show progress on. And the WMO, uh, Paolo Ruti, actually, uh, the, the, the WMO, the, the, the World Weather Research Program chief, will be here on, on uh, Thursday and Friday. And he's been uh, hammering on us that we need to, we, we need to uh, create some what he calls exemplars, which, which uh, highlight uh, real uh, application, potential application value of S2S so that uh, we, we can present this uh, uh, at the next Executive Council of the WMO and really get all the members and, and uh, members of the WMO uh, Met Services really interested in this. Uh, and we know from, from you guys and, and from uh, talking with people in, in, in Met Services uh, around the world that there's a, there's a huge amount of uh, uh, interest in, in S2S. Uh, and so... Uh, 
this is just the beginning. The, the database is, is now online, fresh, and so there's, there's the, we, we just have to now uh, show what we can do with it. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll get on with the rest of the talk. <laughs> so what about the types of uh, forecast user and application uh, that, that we could uh, think about for in, in the S2S context? So I just basically uh, uh, delineate, delineated two major types of uh, uh, user, user, and app, user and application that, that I could see for S2S. And the first would be, I think, really the obvious one, that this is a hazard early warning and enhancing preparedness to high-impact <coughs> weather events. And that was what the S2S was, uh, is, is meant to be all about. Uh, in, the, in the mission statement of S2S that uh, Frederick showed last week, then it says, you know, with special emphasis on high-impact weather events. So uh, the thinking is that uh, hazard early warning, that's something uh, we, we have hazard early warning from weather forecasts. Uh, that, that's something we can push out into the subseasonal range. Another one that's perhaps uh, not quite so obvious is uh, uh, things like management decisions in, in weather-sensitive operations. So even if it's not... Uh, 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 you know, a, a flood or a drought. There may there may be management decisions that make can make use uh, and make make use of uh, subseasonal forecasts and uh, to optimize optimize their uh, their uh, their operations. So I mean, there's a huge range of range of users from from very sophisticated and, and I'm sure uh, Frederick or maybe Frederick will, will, will say something about uh, some of these specific users in, in flood and drought uh, in, in, the, in the talks coming up. Uh, but you're really ranging from uh, things, things like reservoir management, uh, uh, sophisticated operations uh, for uh, hydropower, say, in Sweden, down to uh, uh, developing country use users. And I, I want to sort of emphasize the, these ones here in, in the talk. And uh, this was mentioned in the program that I would say something, something about GFs, yes. But this is where uh, the WMO, is, ho WMO uh, is hoping that S2S can, can really make a, uh, a contribution uh, to, S2, to, to, w, to, to GFCS. And the most obvious, this is the way I'm sure that most of you already seen the schematic of GFCS. And the way that uh, is... Uh, S2S is, is, is housed, is mostly uh, down here in the research modeling and prediction uh, pillars of this, uh, as I've sort of been uh, mentioning going along. But there, there is also this, this aspect of the, the user interface and, and climate information system. So uh, we want to be able to really contribute to this so that we can inform uh, users, government, private sector, research, agriculture, water health, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, these priority areas of uh, GFCS, uh, agriculture, food security, disaster, disaster risk reduction, health, and water, I heard some of those being mentioned by people when they were introducing their, their interests here. And these are where uh, we're hoping also that in your, in, in your projects through the week, uh, we, you'll start to sort of explore uh, the uh, potential value of uh, S2S uh, forecasts and information and linking in your regions with uh, considerations of uh, agriculture, food security, uh, disasters, floods, things like that, or, or health considerations or, or, or uh, uh, water management. So this is uh, a nice little uh, infographic that I, that I like to show that to really starts to get to the question of uh, how, how uh, weather and climate information uh, is being used or, or has the potential to, to be used, and uh, what are the, the types of that information, uh, how is it disseminated to users, and, and what are the kind of decisions that uh, could be impacted. And uh, this is in the case of for how farmers around the world are making decisions based on weather and climate information. And uh, this, this, this schematic, this, this view graph here, uh, infographic, was made by, by the CCAFs, which is uh, the, the CGIAR, the, the, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research's uh, Climate Change Agriculture and, and Food Security Program. 
uh, CCAF. So there's a terrible acronym within an acronym, if you know what I mean, CGAR <laughs> within this acronym. And what, what it's uh, pointing out is really, I think, nicely illustrating that you really need information across time scales uh, when it comes to managing uh, cli climate-related risks. So they're, they're emphasizing you know, weather, days to weeks, uh, climate variability from months to years, and then, then climate change as well from, from, from decades, or, uh, decades or longer. But uh, let's focus here on, on the first two, which are, I think, sort of nicely uh, illustrating you know, S2S to, S to S, uh, bridging across uh, these, these two. So uh, maybe this schematic was made before, before S2S. So we, we, have, we have the weather on the one hand and the, the seasonal months to years climate uh, on the other. And the S2S is, like, like you've heard many times, uh, hoping to, to fill the gap bet between these two and, and link, link weather and climate. And I think also you'll see through uh, Vincent Morin's talks uh, in, in the week how, how uh, uh, methods that, that we can really go about uh, doing that. So uh, what, what are these types of information? And uh, what, what kind of decisions uh, have, they potent have they the potential to inform? So let, let's start with the seasonal ones. Uh, say, uh, a seasonal forecast would be uh, in, in terms of uh, seasonal rainfall or temperature, t temperature conditions, uh, typically. And uh, what could this be used for? Well, it could be used for, for selecting crops or varieties for, for planting, uh, livestock stocking rates, for example, or feeding strategies. Uh, Maybe even the labor market for, for thinking about if you if there's a if the uh, the rainy season expected to be uh, uh, good you may may want more may want to engage more farm workers uh, or intensify crops or, or or diversify them if it, if if the forecast is is rather for below average rainfall and uh, how could these how could this information be uh, better uh, how do we go about thinking about how to you know, tailor the information and seasonal forecast to make it more uh, applicable to these needs? Uh, thinking about seasonal climate variables targeted to particular agricultural risks, uh, dry spells, or, uh, rainy, rainy season start date, etc. And uh, this is starting to think about, uh, well, how do we, how do we uh, tailor information from our forecast to make it of more valuable more value to, to users. What, what are the methods for going about that? Uh, we'll have a lecture on Wednesday uh, on, on that specifically, on, on that tailoring, uh, ta tailoring aspect. And thinking about, well, how can we, if, if we have sub-seasonal forecasts, well, how should they be? How, how should we extract the information uh, that they have? And you can see that if we're getting down to the more daily scale, things like dry spells or rainy, rainy season start date, in a, in a sub-seasonal forecast, we, we could well have uh, more information, more specific information on, on those than you could get from a seasonal forecast. So the other important thing here for thinking about the applications is the, is the piece in the middle, and that's the, the vehicles for delivering the, the, the information, uh, which, is, which is absolutely critical, and uh, that we've seen that. Uh, I think everyone who's worked on, on this uh, uh, in, in this area of uh, applying forecasts for, 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 for applications has, has come down to the, the criticality of this piece in, in the middle. Uh, here, uh, they've emphasized here workshops uh, uh, with, with experts as being one possible way. Uh, it could be training events uh, like this as well, or conversation with agricultural extension agencies working here uh, is also mentioned here. And one thing I'd like to stress is, is the importance of intermediaries in, in linking, linking these two communities together, uh, the user community and the, the, the forecasting community. So it may not be the best strategy for these to talk to each other uh, directly. They may not be able to. And having the right intermediaries in, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to, as, as vehicles for, for uh, delivering the information is, is really a critical piece. And this really has all to be, to be mapped out for S2S. So for the weather scale, uh, then we have things like uh, daily forecasts up to a week ahead, 
And this could be for uh, things like timing of planting and harvest or timing of a fertilizer application uh, or hazard early warning protecting lives. And uh, these are more, maybe more, you could, they're sometimes called tactical decisions. And timing of fertilizer and pe pesticide application, that is something uh, I think where sub-seasonal forecasting also has a, has a role to play uh, in, in these more tactical decisions. So in terms of, of the, what crop to plant, you might still use a seasonal forecast, but in, in figuring out when, how you should schedule your irrigation or, or fertilizer or pesticide application, when that should actually happen, uh, then using weather forecasts or sub-seasonal forecasts, they can come in there. And the vehicles for delivering these things are maybe different as, as well between these two. So uh, SMS messages or radio and television typically for, for, for weather forecasts. So what should it be uh, for sub-seasonal forecasts? What is the way that uh, these, these need to be disseminated? Okay, so I, I've, I've sort of introduced in that, in that uh, previous slide uh, some of the issues in uh, connecting uh, climate forecast information with users and some of the, 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 ways, the ways that uh, people think about doing that connecting. Now, now what I want to talk about is some issues of achieving value uh, for applications using, using forecast information. So some of the challenges uh, to achieving seasonal forecast value have been identified as salience uh, need to meet a user's needs, uh, credibility of the forecast, understandability of the forecast, and legitimate. They need to come from a, a, a trusted source. So I'll just go through those uh, and try to illustrate uh, what these mean. And uh, there, you'll see that often there's quite a bit of uh, overlap in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in what these are. Uh, if, if it's salient information, then it, it needs to be uh, understandable and credible for it to be salient for example. So some aspects of, of salience. Uh, information should be, it should be specific to a, a user's needs and, and, and timely. And so one could think that there is, is somewhere already where if we may have more, we should have more specific information coming from a sub-seasonal forecast because the, the lead time is shorter than we do for a seasonal forecast. So there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity there. Uh, time, <coughs> timely information, uh, according to the user's decisions, uh, a, a sub-seasonal forecast uh, with, with a shorter lead could be more timely to a specific decision like the, applica the application of a fertilizer, for example. And then the other one that's, that's uh, mentioned here is that the, uh, the forecast should, where possible, address a decision-relevant decision variables. And in seasonal forecasting, uh, people have talked about characteristics of, of uh, local daily rainfall, uh, monsoon offset date, or it could be river flow or drought. And this is the, the issue of tailoring. And I thought I'd just uh, flash this one up here that uh, some of you may have seen me present this one before. But the, the relevance of, of daily rainfall uh, for agriculture, I think this is a, a slide from, from uh, Andy Chalinor. And it's just showing for a place in India, Gujarat in India, two different years. So these are time series of rainfall uh, through uh, 19, the growing season, the monsoon season, in the summer of 1975 at the top and 1981 at the bottom. And actually, the total rainfall for those two years was more or less the same. So if you had a seasonal forecast and, and it was perfect, well, then you would have predicted the same, uh, same seasonal forecast for, for both years. Uh, but if you look at the, the yields of peanuts uh, for those locations, you can see that they are actually very different between those years. In, in 1975, where we had the, the, more, uh, the, the more uniform rainfall across the season, that there was a much larger yield than there was in 1981, where we had this sporadic rainfall, and the rainfall all came at once. So obviously, this is something well known, that dry spells are a problem uh, for, for crops. And uh, we, we want to be more specific about uh, what, what the information that we can give. And within a seasonal forecast, maybe we can say something about uh, rainfall frequency, the number of rainy days, 
uh, rather than the seasonal rainfall. Uh, there, there's been work on that. Or on a sub-seasonal time scale, maybe we could actually say something about these the timing of these events. They may not be, they, they may not have any predictability. They may be completely random. Or they may, they, or they may be, they may be associated with uh, sub-seasonal modes such as the, the Madden Julian oscillation. And here's the other one I just wanted to flash up, and this is uh, monsoon onset date and rice planting area in Indramayu, which is in Java, Indonesia. And this is a slide from uh, Rizaldi Bohr from uh, Bogor Agricultural University. And uh, what it's showing here is in the pink bars, these are the, uh, the, the, the seasonality of rainfall. So this is the monsoon season starts at the end of the, end of the calendar year. So we just had the... Uh, we, we, did, we just had the Climate Outlook Forum in, in, in Singapore uh, for the December, January, February, February season, for example. And then what's, what's superimposed on this is for different years, 97, 98 is the red, 98, 99 is, is the magenta, and it's showing the rice planting. So they have two rice crops. They have a double planting of rice, and then they have a fallow uh, in, in the dry season. And so you can see these two peaks. But what's interesting is that uh, the, the timing of these varies from year to year. And particularly this 97-98 event we had where we had the big El Nino, there was a big delay in the planting. So you can see that, it, that the planting didn't start on time. It got delayed. And then what happened was even the second planting was delayed because of that. Everything got shunted later. And that was particularly a big problem at the end of the rainy season. Because they have enough, they have enough rain actually in in uh, Java for their for their crop, even if they plant late. So they wait for the monsoon to start, and then they plant their crop, and it's no problem for the first one because there's plenty. It's, it, it rains plenty there, but then they have problems because everything is late. They'll get into the dry season at the end of the second planting. That's a big problem for drought. So that if you could somehow accelerate this planting, uh, if you if you had a forecast. That the, that the onset was going to be delayed, then you could take various measures to, to accelerate, accelerate that planting, such as uh, making sure the, uh, all the seedlings are, are ready, uh, ready for transplanting uh, and things like that. So this is somewhere where uh, seasonal forecasting clearly has a role to play because the, the El Nino has, uh, the, the, the timing of the El Nino is such that we have forecasts of El Nino uh, in, in the boreal summer, so they could, they could inform this, uh, th this, this application and the farmers here uh, the, in, in, um, in Indramayu province. This, this is, I should say, I mean, they do have irrigation as well, but there are some people with less irrigation, and that's where, that's where this, the, the climate information could be mo most valuable. But, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out this year. Uh, I, I emailed to Rizaldi to say, well, what, you know, it's, it's now been, uh, it's, it's, it's now been uh, almost 20 years since this 97, 98 uh, event. What, what has happened in Indonesia uh, since then? Uh, we've, we've been working with Rizaldi's group uh, for a long time. And uh, so what have they done this year that uh, will, will help them to prevent, uh, prevent this problem in, uh, in, in, in 2016? And, and he told me that, uh, well, now that the, the farmers do, through agricultural extension, get uh, forecasts of, of, of rainy season onset through the, uh, through the MET service in Indonesia. And he said that, that, that many, that, that there's been much, uh, much discussion. Uh, and he said, it's, as usual, it's complicated. <laughs> there, there are many players in this. And uh, it will be interesting to see what, see what actually happens. So the last thing I want to mention here in terms of timeliness uh, is, the, is the cropping calendar. This is something that also in Indonesia, they've been, they, they, the Ministry of Agriculture puts a lot of effort into de developing a, a tool for, for uh, helping farmers with their cropping calendar. And what uh, Rizaldi Bohr and uh, the BMKG, the, the, the Met Service, are doing is uh, to to, to research to what extent can, can we uh, help uh, use forecasts to inform that cropping calendar. And so here you see uh, this is sort of the uncertainty in, 
in, in the yield at the end of the year. And you can see that it is decreasing as, as time goes on. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is the, the various stages of the planting, the, the flowering date, and the harvest, and uh, where uh, a seasonal forecast could come in at the beginning, but then uh, sub-seasonal forecast could really be used in this interim for, for helping uh, in uh, the timing of these <coughs> excuse me, uh, tactical decisions. And then I, this is a, a little schematic that uh, originally came from Tony Barnston at the IRI that I always like to show in these, these kind of events. And uh, so uh, I, I thought, I'd, since I wasn't here last week, I, I thought I'd, I'd just show it now uh, in terms of the, uh, the forecast lead times and where, where the S2S is uh, in this, uh, this central zone here. And the way that Tony had drawn this before was uh, this forecast skill dropping off from the atmospheric initial conditions in, in the weather forecast. And then this ramping up of the seasonal forecast uh, influence, essentially, of SST boundary conditions. But what he had in the middle here, potential sub-seasonal sub predictability from MJO, land surface, etc., just something uh, really, really is a hole here, the, 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 the very, very poor predictability. Uh, predictability desert, maybe that's a term that we've also heard used. And uh, this is the, this uh, time range that where we're hoping to make we're, we're hoping to make uh, progress, and uh, as per the previous slide, demonstrate how that could be used in in uh, in user user decisions in in different sectors. This is uh, toward the same same idea here of. Uh, Multiple, multiple time scales and, and where S2S could sit. It's, it's something that was developed by the International Federation of the Red Cross, Red Cross, Red Cross and Red, Red Crescent Societies with the IRI for, for disaster managers, for their humanitarian aid managers uh, in the Red Cross. So normally if, if a disaster strikes somewhere, big, big floods, then they, they, they react. So they mobilize uh, resources to, to help people who are suffering for a from a disaster. But they realize that if, if they could be better prepared, uh, that, would, that would help them a lot, because they always have to just scramble when, when the disaster strikes. So they, in, in talking with the people at the IRI, uh, Simon Mason included, they, they came up with this ready, set, go uh, idea where you could already get ready using a seasonal forecast. He had some, some uh, idea from a seasonal forecast that the season is likely to be above normal. You could anticipate there may be a, a li higher likelihood of flooding happening at some point in the season somewhere, but you couldn't know where or you couldn't, have, you couldn't be very confident about that. But what you could do is uh, already things like you know, train volunteers and sensitize the community or maybe enable an early warning system if you had a heads up already from the seasonal forecast. Then this, this set stage here, mid-range forecasts, this is where a sub-seasonal forecast could come in that would have more specificity, a shorter lead time, could uh, tell you more about the likelihood about, of where uh, a high-impact weather event, a flooding event could, could occur. And if you, see, if you see that in the forecast, then you could do things like well, alert the volunteers that really, and warn the community that this is actually uh, quite likely. And then go if you see the, the tropical cyclone or the cyclone bearing down in, in, in the weather forecast, then you can activate the volunteers and distribute instructions to communicate to the, the, the community to evacuate or so. So this, this was actually used... Uh, in, in the formulation of the, the S2S project and in the, the, uh, when we wrote the implementation plan, this was, a, uh, in terms of applications, this was one thing that uh, was, was, uh, was made use of to point out where it was that, that S2S could uh, be of value in filling, filling in the middle here between what you could do with a, with a, with a vague seasonal forecast, uh, what you can do 
uh, with a much more precise weather forecast, but you have much less time to act here. So as you go the other way, you have more time to more time to act. And this is a, a, a similar schematic from from Erin Coughlin of the of uh, the, the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, and it's just giving this idea as you go down from from climate change to seasonal to, to weather forecasts, you get more, the, the information becomes more specific, but you have less time to act. You have more time to reduce the risk uh, with longer lead forecasts. So bringing those two th those two things things together is uh, a, a lot a lot to do in, in developing. Uh, the, these kind of applications. So credibility, uh, can I trust the forecasts? So one thing we always emphasize is that in order, in order to make use of a forecast, a, a climate forecast, if you want someone to use it, you have to make sure that that forecast is, is a well-calibrated forecast and it conveys the uncertainty. And that's where you really, uh, that, that's where we really need uh, probabilistic forecasts in being able to convey that uncertainty and uh, that the user needs to know ab about that. So whereas uh, a, d a user might like to just have a, a deterministic forecast uh, that, that tells, gives them a best guess, your, your best guess of what the season is likely to be, li 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 likely to hold in store, what if, if, if you're really serious about using a, a forecast, then, then you want to know, well, well how, li how likely is it that what you're telling me is, 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 uh, is, is going to transpire? So if you look at the IRI forecast maps, you'll see for the seasonal forecast uh, you, many, many white areas where there's just no forecast at all. Uh, and that's because this is a, a, a calibrated product where we're only issuing forecasts in regions where those forecasts have, have skill. And then where we issue uh, a forecast, these probabilities should be uh, that the forecast is well calibrated so that, and this is something we'll, we'll talk about this afternoon, but that the, the, the probability of that, of that happen should be correct on average. It shouldn't, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be overconfident and biased so that you're giving very high probabilities when if you look at all the times when you, you, uh, you uh, issued a 70% chance of being below normal, if that didn't happen 70% of, of the time in practice, then, then you're overconfident. And understandability, that's, that's an issue here with these forecasts, and it's something we've, we've struggled with at the IRI for, for many years. This is, this is our... Uh, sort of iconic product, and we haven't really changed this over the years. I mean, people have complained about this a lot, that it's hard, hard to understand, but we haven't really come up with a better way, better way of, uh, of, of showing this information, and this uh, gets down to uh, this, this issue of, of uh, how, to make it, how to make the forecast understandable. And I thought I'd just flash up this, you may remember this uh, schematic from Adrian's lecture, I guess, probably last Monday. Uh, probably so much has happened in between, I don't know, but <laughs> that must seem a long time ago, uh, last Monday, when, when you first arrived. So should the forecast be probabilistic or, or deterministic? Uh, you know, someone, fr someone from the IMD, I remember saying to me, uh, well, the users, it's what the users want. Now, we give deterministic forecasts because that is what the users want. So often, that, often that's the case, but this is, this is the issue uh, that uh, was, was uh, shown by Adrian last week, that it, the, what actually happens can be way outside of uh, what, what the, the forecast model is saying. And there's no information uh, about uncertainty conveyed in that. So one way, one way for, what, what, how, how can we make that that information more tailored, though. Uh, we think that using thresholds, specific thresholds, may be a way. Uh, I said we've been sort of struggling, struggling with this. And one th I'd like to just show you now uh, quickly, because I know we're sort of already getting into the, the coffee break now. I shouldn't 
Oh, no, not coffee break. Uh, uh, the, the, the next lecture. So I don't want to get too, too far behind here. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'll go, I'll go, go for another, uh, another 10 minutes or so. Uh, we, we thought about, well, how could we uh, express this in a different way that would be, on the one hand, more understandable, and on the other hand, more salient, that it would be uh, something more specific to what you, a user uh, could actually use, rather than having a heads up below, between uh, what's the probability of it being below normal versus near normal versus above normal. Uh, that, that somehow, for, for a lot of users, that, that's, well, I don't really know how to uh, in, interpret that. And so, uh, when, we, when we discuss, well, how should you be able to interpret a, a forecast like that, we always show, well, you need to, to look at your own data to see what, what does below normal or near normal or above normal mean. But I say, this is over 30 years, just ranking the data for your particular place. And so, if you have uh, uh, a 70% chance, like in our forecast now for... for uh, for uh, much of Indonesia, that, that would mean if, if your place in Indonesia has uh, the 33rd percentile, about 45 millimeters of rain, then that would mean that you have a 75% chance of it being less than 45 millimeters. But could we, could we generalize that so that the user can, can pick their own quantile? So that's what we, 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 we call our flexible format of identifying a threshold. So if there's some threshold that users really care about, like how much uh, rain do I need for my rice crop, or uh, what's, the, what's the probability that uh, this coming season is going to be that one year in five drought where my index insurance is going to pay out, that they could choose a particular threshold of rain for a particular amount and find out, well, what's the probability of not getting that amount of rain? So rather than, than this map, the, the corresponding map would be uh, this one. And we, so we call it flexible format probabilistic forecasts. And there's a map room in the IRI data library for this, where you can go in and you can choose your, your target time. Uh, here is December 15 to February 2016. And here, uh, this is where you choose your, your threshold. And uh, you can choose exceeding or non-exceeding of a percentile. Like, like the median, or it could be the 20th percentile, or you can actually choose a, uh, an amount in, in millimeters. So if we zoom in now, to, you, you can just drag and zoom on that map. And I've zoomed into Indonesia here, and what I've, I've chosen is, what's the probability of not exceeding the 20th percentile, which would be the, the one in five year drought? And that, that is what gets shown on this map. So you can see that here in, in parts, of, parts of the maritime continent, you have uh, a 70% chance that you're going to, be, you're, you're going to get that, uh, your, that, that drought year. So we think that this is something that could be uh, more, more salient and be able to target a particular threshold of, of user relevance, as well as being something that people could picture more easily. Think about, well, what, what's the chance of it being that one in five year drought or so, something like that? So we're hoping, we're, we're trying to promote uh, this as an alternative way of, of uh, querying uh, our seasonal forecasts. But still, if you, I think if you go to our web statistics, you'll find that uh, we have a lot of hits on, on this map, but uh, this product is, is buried down somewhere. And uh, not, not, many people, not many people know about it. And obviously, it takes some, it, it takes some explanation to be, able to, to be able to use this. And then uh, what you can also do is you can click on a point on this map. And uh, you can get the, the PDF or the cumulative distribu distribution function for the forecast uh, in, in your region So uh, at your point. So for example, I could see, well, what's the probability uh, of getting 300 millimeters of rain? Uh, and at this point that I chose uh, over the Philippines, there's only, a, there's only about a 20% probability of that versus in, in, a, in, a normal, in, 
in a normal year, it would be uh, an 80% chance that, that you would get that. So by using this tool also, there's a number every year, because if the forecast doesn't have information, then you would just be giving the climatological uh, probability. So that sort of gets around these white areas in the map where you can't say anything from our normal, normal forecast. Here you would be able to say, uh, you'd issue the, issue the forecast in terms of what's the, 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 uh, the, the likelihood from these historical data that you would get a certain amount of rain. So there's, there's always information. So uh, more on credibility and understandability, uh, getting back to this schematic. So proper dissemination of the forecast and communication with their, their meaning is also critical, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, what I want to emphasize is this really co-production of forecasts with intermediary agencies. This is something that we've been pursuing quite a bit at the IRI over the years, uh, with the IFRC, with the World Food Program, or with the National, national Met Services. These are uh, so crucial intermediaries, uh, really the, the legitimate intermediaries when it comes down to, to country-level information. Or regional re WMO regional climate centers like, like ACMAD, uh, agricultural extension services, agricultural universities, I mentioned the one in Indonesia, and then training courses like this one, or once, once we've done uh, with the WMO or, or the IRI, to bring... Uh, uh, people from, from uh, the, 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 the agricultural or, or uh, hydrologic community together with, with forecasters to, to, to co-produce the information. So I realized that, well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a climate person who's not from the application side, then someone who does application, they should really be someone from the application side, but re uh, who thinks about uh, the use of climate forecasts for, for application. But really it takes both. You have to get people in the same room from the, from the user or intermediary communities together with the forecasters. Only then can you share the right kind of information. Uh, sometimes it was popular to say, OK, well, uh, we should have uh, demand-driven information for, to, to inform development of uh, forecasts for applications. But then if you go and ask users uh, to demand uh, the information that they would like, they would say, well, I want to have a perfect forecast uh, of what is going to happen every day. <laughs> so it can't only be demand-driven. It, this, this, uh, it has to be done in partnership. And I think that if there's, there's one thing we've learned at, at the IRI, it's, it's, it's been that, that uh, you have to work together uh, in an interdisciplinary way to, to do this applications problem. So here's a, a little schematic that came from a, 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 an S2S workshop we, we had in, in Korea that we had a discussion, discussion session on application. And uh, then we put in the middle here this intermediate users box here uh, with, with some of these uh, agencies or groups that I mentioned. Could also be uh, WMO commissions for, for agriculture and hydrology, uh, other ones there. Uh, national government agencies, uh, ministries of agriculture, etc., or journalists. And in terms of dissemination, this was, this was the product we actually came up with, uh, with the International Federation for Red Cross and Red Crescent. And it was a map room which allowed a one-stop shop for those humanitarian aid managers to be able to zoom into their region and look at uh, climate information from various sources, such as six-day forecasts from, from, uh, from NSEP, three-month forecasts from, from IRI, looking at uh, past conditions, what's the changes in rainfall typical at El Nino, for example, or, or recent climate, climate trends in the region. So it would allow it. It's, this is an example of a dissemination me mechanism where also if you look at the, the way that the information, uh, the, the terms used here, these are also terms that were, were, uh, were, were conceived with the, with the users together. So in this case, uh, they're, they're, you'll notice that there's no numbers here or probabilities. It's heavy rainfall, very heavy rainfall, extremely heavy rainfall. So we, we think that these, these, this map room concept is a way, if, if, these, are, if these map rooms are, are built 
uh, in, in partnership with intermediaries and users. It's, it's a way to, to help disseminate information. And then lastly, legitimacy. Uh, this is something that's really emphasized by, by the WMO, that uh, forecasts they need to come from a trusted source. That, that one's obvious. But the, the national MET services and the regional climate centers, are, they are the, the legi legitimate conduit uh, for, for uh, forecast, forecast for, for national, national usage. And uh, the WMO lead center uh, for long-range uh, weather forecasting, multi-model ensembles, is the, the intermediary between the global producing centers and, and the national MET services. So this is something that may have been, meant, I'm sure it was mentioned last week, uh, that, that Frederick uh, mentioned this, uh, that our S2S databases lag three weeks in real time so that you can't use the forecast, but that the, the, uh, the WMO lead center will uh, is setting up a prototype now already to, to be able to distribute, distribute those forecasts in real time uh, from several of the GPCs through the National Met Services. So they, they have a mechanism like that for the seasonal forecasts, and they're, they're now doing it for, for the sub-seasonal ones as well. So they actually, access, they, could, they actually access the same database at ECMWF uh, and, and, and pull, that, pull that data without the three-week delay, and so that they have access to the forecast in real time. And later on, that, that, that will be made available to, to the National Met Services. So just as the, the, this is my, my last slide before the summary, and this is just the, the outlook here. And basically, the challenge is, can, can the S2S uh, climate forecast help farmers and others help avoid harm and disaster or take advantages of good years? So this is sort of a societal outcome. It doesn't have to be production. Uh, so you've seen PDFs like this for, for rainfall and climate. But uh, here we're showing it for an outcome. So there can be good years uh, in the green. Uh, there, there can be uh, bad years in yellow, and there can be disasters in brown in this, this left tail here. And can we, can we use this, the uh, forecasting on, on uh, seamless forecasts, if you like, on sub-seasonal to seasonal scales to, to help uh, uh, avoid this kind of situation, disaster and harm? At the same time, if, if conditions are good, you may, would, may be able to choose higher... Uh, use more fertilizer, uh, apply more fertilizer, or, or better, um, higher yielding seeds to, 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 uh, uh, to, to get an opportunity from, from better conditions. So summary of the main points. Uh, I hope to convey that, that the applications is really a hugely mass multifaceted area, uh, and that there's much to be done in, in in uh, and much new that uh, many new opportunities for better specificity and timeliness uh, for for other decisions that, that people couldn't use a seasonal forecast for or people can't use uh, weather forecast for that many other decisions come into come into play here and uh, developing seamless forecasts across uh, the, the information on these different time scales that is really our, our challenge for the future. Uh, much hinges on effective communication uh, of what forecasts can and can't say. Uh, include, this includes uh, doing training events like this. And that proper calibration and verification become critical for people to act on the forecasts. And I'll talk more about this this afternoon, uh, what, what uh, the, the, the challenge is, what, what we want to do on, what we're thinking to do on the, uh, the sub-seasonal forecast for for verification and, and issues of issues of calibration, so I'll I'll, I'll stop I'll stop there and uh, take any questions. Thank you.